Good morning, and thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we are so glad that you are here, and just a special thank you to all of our moms that are here, a part of our church. Man, you guys are the best. <laughs> you guys are the best. Y'all do so many things for us as a family, and we are so thankful uh, for each and every one of you. And we are continuing a series this morning um, as we talk about worship. And so we're in week two of this series. And if you're unable to join us last week, uh, what we did is we began by looking at who do we worship? Who do we worship? As men and women, we are created to worship. And listen, we will worship. That, that's something that we will do. We will worship something. Uh, we're not just talking about religious people, but every person on earth is worshiping something at all times. At all times, the best definition that we could give for that is worship is our response to what we value the most. And so last week we talked about some of those things that we value the most in our life. This could be really anything from relationships to money to success to pleasure, all of these different things constantly trying to get our attention. And ultimately in Acts 17, we saw a people in the, the people of Athens who would worship all these different things, but they didn't know God. They didn't know God, and so they didn't worship him as God. And what Paul does is he then outlines for them, okay, here's who you should be worshiping and why you should be worshiping. And give us four things in that. One is we need to worship him because the, of the greatness of God. The greatness of God, it gives us perspective on who we are and where we came from, that he is great and powerful and worthy of our worship. Second, he's is the goodness of God, right? The goodness of God, that he's the one who gives. We're not giving to him, but he gives to us. And third, we saw the government or the rule of God, that he's in control of all things. And four, we saw the grace of God, that he carries so much for us. He cares so much for us that he actually sacrificed himself. Nothing else and no one else that we worship can we say those same things of. And this morning, we're going to look at how do we worship. All right, so we talked about who do we worship. But this morning, I want us to talk about how do we worship. What does that look like? Now that we understand that God is the object of our worship, that he's the one that we should be worshiping and pursuing with our life, the only place that we'll find ultimate fulfillment and purpose and satisfaction? What does it look like to live a worship-filled life? I was reading a story this week, and a lady named Joni Erickson, she had a terrible accident that, that left her a, a, a quadriplegic. And in spite of her physical limitations, she went on to become an accomplished author and artist. And over 25 years ago, she got married to her husband, Ken. And for her, the wedding that she had planned... She, came, she planned to go down the center aisle, and she was in a wheelchair, obviously, at this point. And um, she was really anticipating, right, a grand entrance, as, as most brides do. And she noticed, though, as she was preparing to come in, two problems that she was facing. First, she had rolled over her gown. She had rolled over a gown, and it had a massive spot on it and a tear in it. And then the flowers that she had in her lap, they had slipped, and they had lodged between her leg and the chair. And listen, in this moment, she was just filled with so much disappointment because everything that she had dreamed that it would look like, it wasn't looking like. And suddenly the doors to the auditorium opened and she saw her husband-to-be. And here was the man that she had committed to and that he had committed to her, his love and his life. And Joni later said, once I saw Ken's face, all I could think of was him. Everything else, the people in the church, the flowers that were askew in my lap, the fact that my dress didn't fall right because I was sitting in a wheelchair, the marks on it, the rips in it, all of it paled in comparison. And listen, the same is true for us. When we see Christ, he's all that will matter to us. When we understand the reality of who God is, it'll fuel our spirit and passion that's within us. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning, is to be able to see Christ, be able to see him rightly and then to respond appropriately. And so this morning we're going to look at a passage in John chapter 4 and we're going to we're not going to read the whole story this morning. This is a story that you may be familiar with, but we're going to just take a, a piece of it. I would encourage you this week to go and to read John chapter 4. It's a powerful story of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. But I would just like to summarize, kind of give us some context of what's happening in this passage and then to read a couple of things out of it. And it, 
What's happening in this passage is a woman who was from Samaria. She comes to this well, and Jesus asks her for a drink. That might not seem too abnormal, but this goes back to what we talked about in our previous series, that when people meet Jesus, he's oftentimes doing things. And what's happening here is there was a prejudice between the Samaritans and the Jews. And it would be improper for him, especially as a teacher, to ask a woman for a drink. Rabbis would often rather go hungry than to even engage in this conversation. But Jesus broke down those barriers he constantly did throughout his ministry. And so they begin to talk about water, and Jesus says something to her. And so let's read in John chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 13 through 15, read that together, and talk a little bit about it. It says this, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I have to come here to draw water. Let's recall what we had just talked about last week again. Looking back at what was said. Jesus is saying that this desire that you have for a drink will return. Right? If you drink this water, you're going to come back and you're going to need more water. Right? It's the natural thing that happens. Our bodies will thirst again. Beyond water he's speaking into in this moment is that the things that we talked about last week, the money, the success, the pleasures, all those things, they'll never satisfy us completely. We'll always be longing for more, always having to come back to that well to get another drink because we're never going to be satisfied in that. We'll thirst again, but what Jesus offers in himself is a continual satisfaction beyond the physical bodies in our spirit that we can drink of, that we can drink of. In fact, the Holy Spirit not only will give us living water, but he says a spring of living water will come up inside of us, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit that will dwell in all of us for all time. That whenever we commit our life to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, it springs up this living water that's in us that we would not thirst for those things again. It's important to understand for us and where we're going that our worship begins in our submission to God. Right, Our worship begins in our submission to God. We have to drink from the living water that comes only by Christ. And in us, the Holy Spirit is given. This is not something that we can manufacture. It's not something that we can make up. No amount of hard work is going to get us there. The, this well that they're looking at, that they're meeting at, that they're talking at, Many years ago, this well was discovered by some archaeologists. They saw it and they found it's one of the deepest wells throughout all of Palestine. It took a lot of hard work for them to get that water up through the well. And what we need to understand this morning is the work has been done, right? The work has been done through the person of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. No amount of work will produce in us and in our life worship in our own strength but only through him, but only through him. He is the only one that we can turn to that will satisfy our soul. We cannot manufacture this thing. So we need the Holy Spirit in our life. And it only comes through Christ. It only comes through us submitting our life to him. And so their conversation continues, but it starts here at this basis that we need Christ and what he does is he identifies some sin in her life. And then she poses a question out of it to deflect away from her because it's much more comfortable to talk about, uh, to discuss religion than it is to face one sin, right? It's easier to be like, okay, so tell me what's going on with all of this stuff instead of being confronted with what's going on in her. And so let's read verse 20 and 21 together here. She says this, Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Will you worship the Father? She did not know who to worship. 
She didn't know where to worship, and she didn't know how to worship. She had some massive questions about what's going on here. So we talk about how to worship. There are a couple of things that we must realize when we talk about how do we worship the Lord in the best way possible. How do we do that? Worship is not confined to a place. All right, it's not confined to a place. There is great joy, and Scripture tells us it's good for us to worship corporately through song, through the opening of God's Word. That's why we do this every week together. It's good to create community, to be a part of a body of Christ. This is good and right that the Word tells us about. However, worship is not confined to that singular moment, right? Worship doesn't start and end at 10 and noon. Like, that's not what is going on here in this passage. As a matter of fact, there are more Christians around the world worshiping as we are this morning in homes rather than in marked buildings. Like all over the world, people are meeting in homes and worshiping the Lord. There's not a set time. There's not a set place, but rather worship is everything we do at all times, at all times. So this changed when Christ died on the cross. Whenever he sacrificed himself, it said the veil was torn in two. And when Jesus ascended, he gave the Holy Spirit. And we now have the living water, the Holy Spirit in us if we are followers of Jesus. And as such, we have access to God and access to his presence at all times and in all places. And what a beautiful and perfect gift that God has given us. Right? But beyond Worship not being confined to a place and worship not being at a set time. Jesus gives us even more on how to worship. And so let's read verse 23 through 26 uh, together. It says this, But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming and he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus lets the woman know and all of us this morning, right? That the day is coming and has now come where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. So what does that mean? All right, so what does that mean? Well, the first thing it means is there are some things that worship is not. And up to this point, it was very ritualistic. It was done in a specific place at a specific time. They had festivals and all the things you can open your calendar. It probably has them listed, you know, in your calendar app, all the different things that are happening and when they're going on. And all of a sudden, all of those things are no more, right? But now the calling is to worship him in spirit and in truth. He just communicated there will not be one central place that everyone has to get to, but there will be many places where worship corporately will happen. And in fact, worship with our life will happen every single day in every place that we go. So along with that, there's this calling to worship him, but also to worship him in a specific way, in spirit and in truth, that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. And so we have to figure out what does that mean? Well, the truth part is is plain enough, right? The truth part is plain enough for us that it's Jesus is the Christ, right? That is the truth about who he is with the coming of Jesus. The truth centers on his person and his work. Jesus, in fact, 10 chapters later in John chapter 14 is going to say that he himself is the truth and the message about his saving accomplishments for us, which is the word of truth, the gospel, Colossians says. It's the word of truth that we are given new life. We are born again in the word of truth that Christians, if we handle it rightly, it anchors our life and saturates our worship right? Saturates our worship. This is what Jesus means by true worshipers. They are true because they belong to him. They belong to him that the word has become flesh and dwelt among us and that he is truly who he says that he is. And we place our faith and trust in him and the truth about his life and his ministry and the things that he's 
calling us to. So in order for us to worship, we must first know the truth. And God's word informs us of this. It informs us of whom we are to worship. That's why every single week we stand under the authority of God's word that, so that I don't just get up and just say a bunch of things, right? To give some self-help talk. That would be horrible for us to do. Our worship is rooted in the truth and the reality of who Jesus is and the work that he has accomplished. That truth is what our worship is birthed out of. But listen, our worship doesn't just stop at truth. Right? Jesus says worship in spirit and in truth. Our worship must also engage the whole heart. It's both head and heart that is engaged in our worship. Unless there is a real passion for God, there is no worship in spirit. Unless there's a true passion for God, there's no worship in our spirit. The truth informs our worship. It informs our worship, and we must worship in our spirit that is now made alive in the work of the Holy Spirit. Right? John Piper says, True worship comes from spirits made alive and sensitive by the quickening of the Spirit of God. God's Spirit it, it ignites, it energizes us in our spirits. So what does that mean? It means that our worship can't be robotic in nature. Right? While the truth is important and it drives who we are worshiping, it should also fuel our passion. Right, The word should fuel our passion for Christ, for the one that we have the truth of. For the one that we have the truth of in our life. Worship, whether singing corporately, listening to the truth of God's word, or in our homes at the kitchen table. Worship engages both our head and our hearts. And it's strong affections towards God rooted in truth. Truth without worship produces dead orthodoxy and a group of people who are artificial admirers. Who are artificial admirers who never really engage or move to the action in our life to worship. On the other hand, emotion without truth produces frenzy and cultivates shallowness or a worship of something not even of God. Piper also says, strong affections for God rooted in truth are the bone and marrow of biblical worship. The bone and marrow of biblical worship. These are our staples for how we worship. He is, here, and here's the great thing about it. Nowhere does it say this, that you must be a great singer to be able to worship. Right? It doesn't say that you have to be musically inclined and, and, and able to, to worship the Lord. Nowhere does it say you have to be in a specific type of building to be able to worship the Lord. Nowhere does it say worship is this or that. There's so much more than those things. Worship is a life that we live. It is what we commit our lives to. It's something that we do corporately with each other and in each other's homes is something we do at our workplace though as well and in our homes with our families right worship is something that's rooted in the knowledge and truth of Christ and then the passion to see his kingdom come right the passion to see his kingdom come a spirit that is energized by his and not something that we manufacture worship is just so much more And if all of this is true and we believe Jesus and we believe his words, how does that change how we worship? That when we gather together as believers and we come in the truth of Christ and who he is and what he's done, that we explode with praise and joy. That we explode in praise and joy and passion at those things. We are passionate in our worship and we are prepared in our spirit for that moment. And if that's true, then that means we have to be intentional in making sure our spirit is ready for worship. That we are engaging the Lord regularly. And it isn't the first time we've talked or seen anything about the Lord, seen the Lord in a week. Right? We worship in spirit, and so we need our spirits to be ready. That means that we have to feed it. 
outside of our external acts of worship, what's really going on in our heart? What is it that we've been pursuing all week with our life? What is it that we've been really pouring into our souls? And if it's the things of this world and not the things of God, then we'll quickly find that our worship is lacking. That our worship is lacking. We have to remember who we are worshiping, and we have to have things in their proper place like we talked about last week. To know who he is and what he is doing. And then in turn to pour that out with our lives. And so we have to begin to understand and see worship is so much more than an hour time slot once a week. It just is. It is about our affections. It's about our life. It's about value. It's about what we find important, what we're sacrificing towards. All of those things is worship. And what Christ is telling us here in this passage is very clear that we will worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we need to have the truth and the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding of God that we get from his word, that we get together in community, that we get an encouragement and talking uh, truth into each other's life and also in our spirit. We worship him in the spirit that that has to be filled up in our hearts and lives. And listen, these moments that we come together, they can be those moments where our spirit is you know, elevated and raised and, and fed and brought life and all of those things, but we can't just allow it to die again for the next week and then come back and try and raise it back up and then to die all week again and then come back and raise it up, but to figure out a different pattern where it's like this is a moment where we're going to come alive in our spirit and then tomorrow morning we're going to feed it again. Right? We're going to feed it again tomorrow and then the next day and the next day and we're going to miss days along the way. Absolutely, that's going to happen and we're going to struggle and it's going to be hard work and all of those things but we are going to do the best that we can to change where we're at and to feed our spirit every single day and so this morning as we wrap up here and we think about all that God has done and all that God has said about who to worship and how to go about worshiping how is your worship you know as you think about for your own life think about where you're at. How do you worship the Lord? What is your worship looking like? It's really a barometer, a, a test for us to be able to see, okay, is there some things maybe going on? If you go to see a doctor, there's a couple of things that they do immediately to try to get a, a diagnosis, see if there's anything major going on in our life, right? Like they'll check your heartbeat, see what's going on, have you breathe, they want to check your temperature. Those are just some simple markers of saying, okay, is everything going all right? in this person and the same happens for us spiritually we need to put the the tet the whatever it's called that you listen to the heartbeat that we're going to put that on our chest and say okay is everything okay here or if i look at this is my worship lacking right is my worship lacking is it not where it needs to be do i find myself dry and empty during the week and, and what why is that am i not spending time with the Lord? Am I not taking those moments? Do I not have the truth of God's word, you know, infiltrating my life and my heart on a regular basis? Do I lack passion and zeal for the things of God? Well, why is that? What, what is going on here? Is it because I'm not worshiping him? Are there other things in my life that I'm allowing to take that place that I'm turning to and worship and trying to find satisfaction in life in? Or do I need to turn back to him? And, and this morning's a moment that we have to do that together. That we can look at our life and say, okay, where am I at and how do I get here? How do I get here? And so I just want to give you a couple of minutes there where you're at just to talk to the Lord, just to be still before him, to, to have a conversation with him. Say, God, would you search me this morning? Would you search my life? Would you search my heart? Are there things in me that are lacking? Am I turning towards other things for my worship and praise and devotion? Maybe this morning you realize that 
you've over overcorrected one way or the other that it's all about just the truth and because of that there's no passion there's no zeal there's no heart connection between you and the Lord you're not taking on the heart of God and the work and the ministry that he did and saying okay now I need to go and to take up this mantle that God has given me and carrying this out with passion for the things that he is do doing and done or maybe the other side of the the spectrum and it's just all about that and we don't have the words of truth and life in us and because of that we find ourselves tossed to and fro all different directions by the world and culture and the ups and downs along the way it's both of those things have to be evident in our life and if the Lord reveals something to you brings something to the surface tries to bring correction and just allow him to because we talked about last week he's good and he is gracious but you don't want to run from him but allow him to speak into those things and to bring healing and so father this morning we come before you as a, a group of people, as a local body of believers. And Lord, we just want to say, we want to worship you rightly. We want to worship you fully. Like we want to, to be better at this. We want to get better at worshiping you in the choices that we make, in the life that we live, in our gathering moments where we're worshiping you. We want all of that to just be better, more honorable, more glorifying to you. And so, Lord, we need your help. We need your help. This world is hard. It's difficult. There are so many things trying to get our attention every single day. And so, Lord, we, we want you to to speak into our life. And so, God, I pray that you would reveal specific things in us that either we're worshiping instead of worshiping you or things that are tearing us away from our time with you. And, Lord, that we would make a decision this morning to, to become more, uh, to become better worshipers of you, to make the choice that, that we are going to know your truth and know your word, that we are going to carry with us the passion and the zeal for the things of God and the work that you're doing. And Lord, would you just show us a little picture of what that looks like? God, I pray that this week we'd experience your presence and your nearness in ways that we, we haven't before. Lord, in supernatural ways that we would see that you are present and near and Lord that you administer to our hearts and fill our souls and spirit up Lord that we are ready to worship you in all the different ways whether that's at our workplace at the dinner table or when we gather together that our worship would just be so rich and so full because of you and so we lay ourselves before you and say God do in us what needs to be done to get us there we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. And um, like I said, one thing that we always want to do, right? We always want to do is we want to be obedient. Okay, so as the Lord speaks things into your life, if you recognize like, yeah, yeah, I've always struggled, you know, with reading God's word. I've always struggled with with having a consistent time with him. Right? I've always struggled with taking what I read and putting it into action in my life. If you look at those things and you see that and the Lord reveals those things, well, then make some choices to try to change that. And if you need to talk to someone, you know, you can text me, you can text Ryan. We would love to, to meet with you and talk to you about what that can look like for you and your life. And, and listen, we're all trying to figure it out together. Maybe someone else in your group that in your discussion time as you're talking will bring things to the surface that you're able to answer. All of that is good. All right. So let's take time. Let's share. Let's discuss. And let's grow together in this. All right. So thank you guys so much. Hope to see you next week.